Once again, it's a very warm welcome to our Black Opal and Lord's Taverners webinar. Um, we've tried to keep everyone amused through these winter months. There's been a lot going on, of course, elsewhere overseas, uh, where people, some people have been away to enjoy the sunshine. Others have been in darkened rooms in London to appreciate the talent that's been on show and some short games, which we'll discuss in a moment or two. And once again, we have a stellar panel. So as I look at it from left to right, uh, I'll introduce you first to Steve Harmison, uh, whose reputation is uh, well established on the field and is now being well established off the field as one of the voices of talk sport. Uh, Steve, very good evening to you. How are you? Very well, David. Yes, very well. It's, uh, it's nice to see the sunshine and have a chat because it's been some dark mornings in England. I've had some dark times. Um, how very apt. Uh, well, mm -hmm. let's, try and, let's try and shed some light on it and make this a sunny evening. Um, Gladstone, you're still there. Nice to see you again in that hallway. Have a move, buddy. Tethered to the spot, maybe. You know they have extended the uh, stamp duty sort of uh, holiday, so you can probably afford to move if you really want to. I mean, this this you know this one bedroom studio of yours with shelves is lovely, um, but of course it's up to you. It's warm, matey. It's warm, oh, and I've, it. I've, I've got a, I've got a beer on the go, so that that'll do for now. Okay, I'm sure Steve's got something. We've got a small scotch here. Um, Nick Nick Knight, uh, once known as Sky's um, one day expert, now. Flavor of the month all over India as well. Nick, how are you? Thank you very much. Yeah, nice to be home. Long trip. Uh, about 11 weeks I had out there. Dubai, Chennai, Great. Nick, do, hang on, Nick. Um, it's lovely to almost hear you, is what, all <laughs> I can say. If you, I know you've propped your phone up. This is, this, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Nick is the master of technology. And he is. He has bought himself a very cheap off-the-street device <laughs> for propping up iPhones, which appears to muffle <laughs> all the stuff. <laughs> Just give it a go. Can, can you hear me any better now? Oh, that's lovely. Okay. Is that better? Can you bear with me? Because he's going to have to hold his phone now for the next hour. <laughs> simple as that. Right. Um, guys, thank you very much indeed for being with us here tonight. As I say, you're following in a long line of uh, fun webinars that we've had to discuss events over the winter. Uh, now, the obvious thing is the two of you from different angles and different time zones have been watching uh, what's been going on in India recently. We know what the result is. We know what the talking points were. Um, Nick, first of all, to you, how was it in India when you were out there? Well, I mean, David, you, you'll know what it's like over there. I mean, the excitement levels were huge. The anticipation was huge going into the series, obviously, because of what happened in Australia, where, where India came back from losing the first test match and won the series. So generally the excitement levels were high. I think the expectation levels were pretty high on England as well because they played well in, in Sri Lanka. So lots to look forward to. I mean, I covered, as you know, David, the first two test matches. I didn't cover the last two. Um, so I covered the first game where England won. And again, that just heightened any expectation there was to be had for the series because England had probably, uh, probably delivered more in that game than perhaps people had first thought. So Kohli was under pressure, India were under pressure, um, and then for India to fight back, it was, it was quite brilliant. So to be just immersed in, in Indian culture, to be part of the series itself on the ground was absolutely fascinating. I mean, no, normally, David, we're, in, we're stuck in a studio, as we have been, I think, for the 216 series, mm -hmm. uh, and we see it from afar. But to be out there on the ground and see it happen in front of you was, was quite fascinating. And what was it like working for BCCI TV? Um, interesting, um, but, but, but great. I mean, fascinating, really, To I mean, as you'll know, David and, and Harmi and, 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 and some other people are lucky enough to have worked on the TV, you, you'll know that, that some of the productions are a little bit different. The expectations mm -hmm. are a little bit different. And the way it's all run is just a little bit different. But I'd say fascinating, really, and great. I worked for Sony as well. I don't know if you've ever had anything to do with Sony. But Sony were terrific. I mean, to work for that production in the studios in Mumbai was a great experience. Yeah, yeah. and I was going to say, I bought a Walkman in about 1970. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, things have moved on a little bit from yeah. those days, Dave, yeah. lads. Trust me, that's more Even now he's moved on from <laughs> then. You've managed in 40 years as well. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, even my phone. <laughs> um, Steve, a uh, very different angle for you guys at TalkSport because you had to be based in London. Uh, talk us through the mechanics of that first. Uh, we were based in, obviously, on the 17th floor of the news building. There was mm -hmm. seven of us 
um, on you know some some early mornings. Darren Goff, myself, Mark Nicholas, Butch. Butch was the the lucky omen because look, Butch did the first day of the second Test match, uh, and I think the second day, sorry, the first day of the third Test match. And the second day of the of the last test match, which was more or less the only full day of cricket that yeah. Butch did. So every time Butch popped in, England had a shocker, and we got three days, two or three days off. But it was it was it was enjoyable. It was hard watching the yeah. way England had uh, not so much performed, but the way they were going about things. Um, and it was it, yeah, it was quite different. Darren Goff at one o'clock in the morning is not a pretty sight. I've seen him after he's had a curry and about sixteen beers. Yeah, I, you all look the same, but when he's first getting up and you're sober as a judge, going to commentate at that time in the morning is very, very difficult. So it was, um, but the cricket was, the cricket was something that I think was predictable. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of talk about rest and rotation and we had KP for a day and a half and he's, he's put his two pennies worth in two again pennies. today like and it's it was but it was it was enjoyable to commentate on i must admit yeah, it. Sure. there was something happening all the time uh, even though it was a really poor cricket yeah I and mean, again before before we get on to the the important stuff i the cricket i'm sure people will be interested to know the literal mechanics so your 17th floor uh, just near london bridge there modern building modern studios um, but you're not sitting on sofas discussing it comfortably over a hot cup of steaming tea, are you? It's no, a we were protocol as well. So we were you on, obviously you're on a 17 four. Lovely views once the sun came up, you know, over the overlooking um, overlooking London. If you've worked with Mark Nicholas ever, you realise what what Mark's like at painting pictures and telling you exactly what's happening, especially from a radio. He's yeah. magnificent at doing that, and the view was was stunning. Um, but you're in a room. Uh, basically an office block with seven seven great big tables, you know, three either side, one at the back end, uh, perspex all the way around it, um, two 60-inch TVs, one halfway in the room, one at the other end of the room, um, and you had the three lead commentators on one side of the room, um, and you had you had the the four guys, well, three or four guys on the other side of the room, talking about talking about the game, and there was some good banter between the two. It was. But it was it was difficult because it was it was so difficult from a, a COVID point of view. Everybody had their own table to work from. We mm. all had your own table of food to eat from. So yeah. you know, seven different tables. If you wanted a coffee, it got put on that table. And yeah. You had to go out and get it. You wanted food, you had to go up and get it. But as you can imagine, I'm going to sound sticking a boot in a Goffy. Goffy's table was always more full than anybody else's, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, but like you said, from a camaraderie point of view, it was quite good fun because you mentioned about being on a sofa or sitting in a studio. Oh, it's like all seven years sitting watching the same game all the time. So you were bouncing ideas off people and you were bouncing sort of talking points off, off, off each other over the course of the day when, when the cricket was happening. Well, to be fair, I mean, the talking points kept coming thick and fast without anyone really having to, to think yeah. about it. Um, I mean, an extraordinary series. I guess, I mean, Nick, coming back to you, I mean, I guess, yeah, we, however optimistic England cricket supporters are, uh, and obviously it is possible to go to India and win, there is always the distinct possibility that India in India might just come out on top. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Stephen, you've just 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 nailed it, really. I mean, having been out there, I mentioned about the expectation level of England, but I think the reality for those of us that had been out there before um, was that, I mean, I got asked a prediction before, like we all did. And I, I mean, I'm not trying to be smart in hindsight, but it was an easy prediction. I said 3-1 because I felt England would win one game. I felt that Joe Root would get runs. I felt that Ben Stokes would make a contribution. And I felt that Jimmy Anderson or Stuart Broad would probably get enough reverse swing to bowl India out, whose batting is a little bit vulnerable at times. So it was it was pretty easy, I thought, or relatively straightforward to make that prediction. But the reality is that India were going to win the series. It's just how well they won the series. So for me, again, I, I kept it incredibly simple. It was really down to the two spinners or the two sets of spinners. And, you know, India don't themselves play spin particularly well. I mean, you can, you can exert, exempt um, Virat Kohli and Rohit Sharma from that. But actually, it was really Ashwin and Aksar Patel that made the difference. And, and Jack Leach, you couldn't really expect, in my opinion, Jack Leach and Don Best to be anywhere near Ashwin and Patel. So that's really where the game was won. And England were hoping, I think, to get some reverse swing as they did in the first Test match 
and that was really their best chance of winning. Uh, but the pitches, and I'm sure you'll talk about the pitches later, the, yeah. the pitches for the first two test matches were so different, so, so different, and that had a major impact on England. Well, yeah, obviously in that first one, batting first and getting runs was all part of anyone's plan uh, in India at any stage, and it worked beautifully well. And Joe, I mean, Joe Root has been in spectacularly good form, uh, obviously first one in Sri Lanka, uh, then in that first test match, and especially well, especially in that first test match in this latest series. But even he, in the end, only averaged 30. So it was the only one to average 30. So let's just, whatever the disparity in the spin department and the ability to use conditions, how concerning, Steve, I'll come to you, how concerning might it be, uh, I'm not going to say is it, might it be, uh, that the top three could hardly average 10 or couldn't even average 10? Yeah, it was it was always going to be, I thought it was always going to be a concern because of the way their techniques are. Um, and I think this was before, I'm like 90, I, I didn't say 3-1 on the breakfast show, I said 4-0 because I didn't see England winning a test match. You know, I, India have lost three test matches in a decade in India. Tells mm. you how strong these guys are in their own back garden. We might have won the day night one, that was the only thing I could think of. But our top three was always going to worry me because of the way especially with Johnny coming in after the second test match, it was the technique. The opening baton, the, all, three of our, all three of our players at the top of the order, whether Crawley, Sibley and Burns, have got a technique where there's a big, big goal gap between bat and pad. And a lot of it is from a technical point of view. And mm -hmm. I think while when the ball was spinning or not spinning, there was always going to be a technical deficiency and that was going to cause us a problem. Root going to get in too early, that exposes um, Stokes. So from the, the top three point of view, in India, I always thought it was going to be an issue. Fast forward throughout the summer and the Ashes, I do not have a problem with our top three because yeah. I think they play the ball well. They leave the ball quite well on, on seam and bounce and surfaces when they face seam. Not a problem whatsoever. I, I could back all three of them to stay in the, in the top three. But we talk about horses for courses and hindsight's a wonderful thing. We pick bowlers to put on certain services. I said at the start, we should have picked Keaton Jennings right at the start. And I got bombarded with, you're just saying that because he played for Durham. And I'm like, no, he might not. She might struggle in England. But if you put him in spinning conditions at the top of the order, he scores runs because he picks his bat up straight. He brings it down straight and his bat's out in front of his pad early. So which you play the straight ball, the turning ball he misses. That was that was so simple, and how England couldn't see that, especially when they're going to take twenty five players away. I just don't. I, I really, I really didn't understand. But I haven't understood this selection panel, and I, and I still, yeah, management selection. That's for another another sort of topic of the conversation. But that really has let England down because if you're one, two, three, you don't score any runs, and you're consistently yeah. being twenty for two. No matter how good your middle order is, no matter where you are playing in the world, you're not going to win test matches. England got bowled out for 112 in the second test match on the night he was talking about, and the pitch they were, they were and KP was defending. I sat with Kevin Peterson, he was trying to defend the surface, and it was simple. I, I shot him up in his two seconds for the simple fact is stop protecting the IPL broadcasting contract and see it how it is. You know, <laughs> this is a poor pitch, it's not good enough. Yeah, yeah. And if India are getting bowled out by our spinners or our bone attack for 145, it tells you the surface is not good enough. And that, for me, was the crux of the top order. If your top order doesn't perform, mm. you ain't winning games. All right, Nick, I mean, the, there are so many aspects to this. I mean, Steve's absolutely right. I mean, if, in very, very simple terms, if three of your top six, if three of your, therefore, key batsmen are not able to adapt, not able to make your runs, you're always going to be behind the eight ball. But how much is it to do with... Um, the way the game has changed since, for instance, DRS, since techniques have had to change, since that second line of defence is no longer a line of defence, but actually as much a method of attack. So bold or LBW uh, comes into play so often now, much more than it used to. How much does that change the game, do you think? Hugely, David. I, I mean, techniques have tried to change on the back of it. I mean, we, I got a grandstand view. Our commentary box for that Chennai test series or test couple of games was right bang behind, as it often is, for the broadcasters. And you could see it was extremes, really. Har Harmy's right. You know, the pitch was extreme. The conditions were extreme for that second test match and beyond. Hmm. But what it meant, when you get extreme conditions... It just shows how good the really good players are. And by that, I mean Joe Root against spin, 
Virat Kohli, Rohit Sharma. The three of those, for me, stood out for the way that they played spin. And, you know, now's not the time to get all technical mm. about where you should put your bat and your hands and your head. Mm. But actually what they did really well and stood out way beyond everybody else was how fully forward they got and how they used the crease and went back and just gave themselves just a little bit more time. And then you put the other players into it. And, I mean, we all know as England players playing and growing up in county cricket, you don't have to get fully forward at Chester the Street, at Chelmsford, at, at Edge Baston. You don't have to because the ball doesn't turn and bounce like that. And therefore, you can get away with playing sort of half pop forward and the job is done. But in those conditions, you can't get away with it. So the likes of Crawley and Sibley, and, and you make the point, and you make the point well, they were always going to struggle in those conditions because they're not used to getting fully forward and fully back. And to watch Virat Kohli play our spinners, and I know it's not Ashwin and Patel, but the way and the ease with which he played the ball alongside his, he got out in front of his pad, but the way he played alongside the ball rather than lurching out too far in front was just eye-catching. But he also got out for naught. I'm, going to, I'm only going to make that point as a sort of, um, as an example, that even the best in the world, if they misjudge one early, get out for naught. I mean, he got out. Well, and, and, Dave, and Dave, actually, he gave a really good interview after that. Mm. I think it's the first innings of the second test match when Moen bowled him outside off yeah. stump. And then you watch him in the second innings and he didn't play one shot on the offside because yeah. he told himself that wasn't, you know, he was almost saying to himself in interview or he said in interview that he was saying to himself, that was a bit of arrogance. That was a bit of me trying to show the world how good I was on this turning pitch. Yep. And actually, yep. even I wasn't quite good enough. And I disrespected it a little bit. And I went back to the basics of the game. And then he played completely differently in the second innings to the way he played in the first. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the thing is always that if you, as a batsman, if you can survive, shall we say, 20 minutes, which is not as easy necessarily as it sounds. I mean, but if you can survive 20 minutes, then you have a better chance because you pick length better, you pick lines better, you pick everything out of the hand better. Um, but it's just always nice to know that even Virat, as the best in the world possibly, uh, can make a first ball mistake. Right, yeah. let's leave the batsmen alone for now. They've had, they've probably had enough. I mean, their ears will be burning yet again. I think Steve's point's a good one actually, that when you come back to the UK or come back to different conditions where your talents maybe will, well, should flourish more readily, uh, runs will, I hope, flow. Just. Talking about spin, um, what, we what we do on these things, we invite questions from our audience. Some of them are sent in ahead of the game, including these. Um, we have a regular, Rohan Hander from uh, Hartley Whitney, who is a young spinner aged 13. So it's very dear to his heart. So Rohan, hi to you again. He says, basically, should there be more opportunities and a dedicated elite development pathway for spin bowlers in this country? Uh, reflecting the fact that we have a relative dearth of great spinners here, or good spinners even, compared to other countries. So it's all about how does someone like that, age 13, uh, get a, a way of learning how to bowl spin? And also, I'm going to broaden the question slightly, because that's he's 13 years old. For our young spinners coming into county cricket at, say, 17, 18, what chances have they got when county cricket is played in winter, i.e. at the start of the summer in March, and at the end of the summer in October? I might just have exaggerated slightly, but that's kind of <laughs> you know, the way it goes. Uh, Steve, what's, what's your thought on that? Um, well, it is a difficult one because, like I said, the, the whole English cricket system was set up probably a couple of years ago, geared up to win it. And this, this, this can go off on a different topic later on, but was geared up to win the 2019 World Cup. So the 2019 World Cup was right. We're going to play out our best surfaces, white ball cricket in the middle of summer which the, the, the four-day game, the Red Bull game, really sort of took a hit. Seven at the start, seven at the end, and well, eight at the end, whichever way you, you want to look at it. I remember, I remember Scott Borthwick getting picked for an England test match in Sydney a few years ago. Yeah. It was the last test match of the, of the series. Um, and I was asked what Scott Borthwick needed to, to get into the England team for the first test match of the summer. And I said, England, England needed to centrally contract him and send him on loan to an Essex or a Sussex. Now, I wasn't talking about from a former Durham cricketer. I was talking about an England, potential England cricketer trying to get his best because you can't feel the ball un until the end of May yeah. when you're bowling yeah. at Chester Street. That's if you get a ball, a ball at all. 
So it's where you play in the country, but also I think there are there are there should be areas that we have, and we've got some good spin bowling coaches, the likes of Peter Such and the likes of John Embry, all these guys who have got talent, who have had talent, who are very very good at giving their their, their experience. But unless the country want, unless the, the country wants to provide somewhere, then they're not we're not we're not going to go any further forward. And I think what we've got is we've got a system which doesn't work for everybody. So let's let's try and find somewhere at the back end of the season. For me, I think there should be cricket in the middle of the season, but the back end of the season, when the pitches are dry, that's when we should be developing more more chances from from a spin bowling department. But it's not just actually bowling spin. It's actually playing spin as well, because how many times have we gone to countries where we've struggled? We struggled when we went to the UAE. We struggled when we went to Dubai, Dubai and the UAE. We've now struggled going to India. We've got a Pakistan next year. You know, if that tour's on, these things that England need. I look at someone like Dan Lawrence. Yes, he was hidden away at number seven, but Dan Lawrence has just come off the back of spending a bit of time in Sri Lanka. He did well in he did well in Australia in the, in I think last winter with the, AS, uh, the National mm-hmm. Academy. But he spent some time in Sri Lanka at an academy just learning how to play you know, and developing the art of spin. Like Knight, you said, getting right forward or right back. So there are there are avenues out there. You've just got to search for them, but you've actually got to buy into what what these these camps are. And I don't think the ECB buy into it as much as what they probably do with a sending four or five fast bowlers to Potchestrom with, yeah. a, with a Neil Killeen or a, a, a Glenn Chapel. Yeah, there should be spin bowlers going all over the world to, to give them the best chance. Because at the end of the day, that's the only way they're going to find out. We talked about it at the start. It's not Ashwin and Axar. It's not Swan and Panasar. You know, the best we have got is because Mo and Ali didn't go. Is Bess and Leach. Now, whether they're up to it or they're not up to it, you've got to, you've got to give them something, some tools or some experience to give them the best chance. And I don't think we do. Well, Leach, of course, <clears throat> does play at Taunton where it does spin. And mm. I think he, he admits he's benefited from that because he's learned to bowl on turning pitches, he's had encouragement. And of course, the point you make quite rightly is that he does get a bowl. Um, my point is partly that if you're not playing four day cricket in the middle of the summer, which is the optimum time for pitches to be at their best, their driest possibly, and to offer turn, well, what chance have you got if it's all white ball cricket and or test cricket at that stage? You've got nowhere to really learn the game. Um, Nick, come back to you. There's another question here. We've got another question here. Uh, Ian Sutherland, who's very well researched here. Uh, fourth test match, spin friendly pitch. India's three spinners took 18 out of 20 wickets. England's three spinners managed two for 216. There's a bit of a disparity there. Um, he mentions there's been a lot of money uh, either spent or due to be spent or promised to be spent at Loughborough, uh, maybe three million pounds. That's mentioned here. A spin bowling fund of three million pounds to pay for coaching and talent identification. Um, if that has been spent, the return at the moment <laughs> probably a little bit low. Um, but I mean, it's, I mean, what can we just any more ideas? Because it's all very well. Yes, you can do things with internal pitches, with indoor pitches, and make them officially turn. But that's rather different to a dust bowl in Chennai or Ahmedabad. Um, and you can spend time as spinners indoors, but it's all about somehow getting that experience outdoors. So, I mean, what about these? What about the idea he mentions here? Overseas apprenticeships. So if you're not playing for anyone overseas in the winter, before you get your chance to play for England, go to India, spend you know, four months there. They used to have Dennis Lilly's Fast Bowling Academy, for Christ's sake, in Madras, in Chennai. So surely you can have a, an arrangement somewhere where somewhere on that subcontinent, you can have a spin guru, uh, could be Mushtaq, could be any number of Indian spinners, uh, could be Harath in Sri Lanka, anyone like that. You, you could maybe send a few people out there to learn the art. I think, David, that the ECB will, if they were on this call, someone who'd been involved in this would probably say, well, they've tried to do that with um, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, that where they set up an academy out there a good few years ago, where you'd say subcontinental conditions. So I think they've made an attempt to do that. I mean, I, I would also add, I mean, Zach Crawley took himself out to India a couple of years ago. Yeah. I, I mean, that's just purely from a batting perspective, but try to do the same thing. Okay, he's you know well resourced and he can just take that and do that and get on with it on his own. Not everybody can do that, but there's an example of it. I think the ECB are trying to do that sort of a thing. The, the one thing I think I would add to what's been said already is I, I had the pleasure of interviewing our Ashwin, Ravichandran Ashwin in the winter just a couple of months ago or a month ago. 
I listened to Jeet and Patel, two, two very classy spinners in a slightly different era. But to listen to Ashwin talk about his art is well worth it. If you're a young spinner, try and listen to everything he talks about in interview because he doesn't just talk about turning pitches. He doesn't just talk, talk about the ball turning on a dusty, dry surface. What he talks about, which I find fascinating, is the variety, what he tries to do, pace of delivery, pace of release, angle of seam as it's going down, working out batsmen, all the little things and nuances of spin bowling that can sometimes get lost in we need a spinning surface, we need it to be dry, we need the conditions in our favour. What spin is all about as well, from what I can gather from these experts, is the smaller little bits that you can go away and work on in the nets, whether it be Chester the Street, um, anywhere in the country when perhaps you're not going to get a bowl. Go and, you know, Sakhalin Mushtaq, I remember an interview with him years and years ago, the great Sakhalin Mushtaq, said he used to go to bed almost with a cricket ball. He used to, all day, he used to wander around with a cricket ball in his hand, working out how he could get that ball down 22 yards slightly differently. How could he get a bit more from the ball? And, and he was fascinated by his art. And I think when you're fascinated by your art, as these great, great bowlers are, you're probably more likely to get more out of your art than if you're just hoping that the sun shines, you've got a dry surface and I'll bowl spin. Yeah. I think yeah, 90 as well. Cool. Sorry, David. There's, there's a um, talk about Ashwin for, for the young lad who's 13. He's on YouTube and he's got, he's one of the only ones of the modern generation that's got his own YouTube channel. And the way he talks on his YouTube channel is fascinating. It is. It's great. And he's very accessible and he, he speaks about it very, very well. So if you want to learn, go on, because all these young kids now are just YouTube mad. Go on YouTube, type in Ashwin and listen to what he's got to say. He's got millions and millions of followers. The reason why he's got millions of followers is because he's got 400 test wickets and he's very, very good. Yeah. Well, just, yeah. Well, I mean, I watched him in that series in Australia where you had Ashwin versus Lyon in Australian conditions, and Ashwin out bold line. Yeah, in 400 test match wickets, he got, it, I think, in that series, Nathan Lyon, a great, great... But even Ashwin worked out. And to watch him, he was over the wicket a couple of balls. Then he was round. Then he was just up constantly. I mean, it was, it was a masterclass. Yeah. Right, another question. Um, the duo, that is Adrienne and Malcolm Summerfield, have actually three and one here. Um, let's talk about Johnny Bairstow for a moment, because... He went from scoring runs in Sri Lanka and looking in very fine form, enjoying his return to the test team, to going home, coming back to India and couldn't, get, couldn't buy a run, couldn't buy a run. So um, is that wholly attributable to the rotation system? That's the question. That's the first part of the question. Uh, coupled with arduous return travel circumstances, quarantine, maybe the lack of practice, I don't know. Um, what do you reckon, Nick? I guess it's the, the bigger picture, really, of the rotation policy. Are we, are we in favour or not? I, I personally quite like the idea of the rotation policy in theory. Um, and Johnny Bairstow obviously played a part in that and was one of the first because he played pretty well, as you say, in Sri Lanka and then went home. And there were many people perhaps who felt that he would have taken a place in that first Test match side in India. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the only issue I have with, with, with rotation having been out there and been part of the bubbles, which, which are tough at times, mm -hmm. is the flexibility. I, I, felt, I felt that in that second test match, when Jimmy Anderson had bowled so well in that first one and Stuart Broad was clearly coming back through rotation into the second, yeah. I felt then England missed a trick. It's almost like rotation was, right, we've almost set it out so far in advance. Anderson plays one, then he plays three at Armored Bad in the day-nighter. I think within the rotation policy, there was just an element to be a bit more flexible. And then I think the rotation policy perhaps might have seen or been seen a little bit more favourably than perhaps it was at times. Um, but I, I mean, as I say, I was in a bubble for 11 weeks in Mumbai and Chennai, and I'm not going to sit here in my house at home, cosy chair, compl complaining in one bit that it's tough because I chose to go out there and I chose to put myself in that position. What I would say is what I would say is that um, I think the rotation policy and looking after players generally for this year and those 17 test matches and the amount of cricket that they've played, uh, it's a big tick for me, but it needed a bit more flexibility. Okay, Adrian and Malcolm got another question here, which is quite interesting to me, actually. 
Are the English team not able to have access to practice on similar pitches to the test match wicket in India before each test match? Now, um, <laughs> begs the question, <laughs> those last two pitches especially, <laughs> if someone had prepared net pitches like that, they'd have been sacked, uh, even you know, by the Indian team, let alone the England team. I mean, it's a good question because in order to prepare for dust bowls, I mean, although it, were two, I mean, it was the third test match that I thought was comfortably the worst, but in order to prepare for something like that, People don't actually prepare net pitches the same way, do they? Or do they? Well, no. Uh, no. Uh, go on, Heidi. Well, n well, no. I mean, you're right. I mean, having been out of Chennai, that I mean, the pitches they were practicing out somewhere out the way out the back, and I, yeah. I mean, we, we weren't really able to access those because of the bubbles that we were in, etc. Yeah. Et but yeah, I, I mean, clearly. I, I mean, the one thing I would add to that is the, ch the Chennai pitch for the first Test match. Yeah. I went and had a look at it, and you, as you do as a commentator, you, mm -hmm. this day and age with COVID, you get about five minutes to do a quick pitch report, and you look at the pitch, and you make an assessment on the pitch. And the Indian commentators who were with me said, this will be a real belter for three or four days, and then it'll turn. Now, to me, it looked like it was going to turn on day one, but it was red soil. They call it red soil, mm -hmm. and it held together, and it was very firm. And that is what exactly happened. And then you look at the pitch for the, the second pitch, which was about three blocks up, and... As you put your hand, and you'll know this, David and Harmi, when you put your hand on the pitch and just rub it, basically your hand comes back up with dust and debris. I mean, the whole thing was falling apart even before a ball was bowled. And mm -hmm. so that, that had a huge impact, obviously, on the ball turning. But also, and, and this has probably not been mentioned much, but I have a strong belief on, no reverse swing. You know, no one had played a first-class game on that ground for a year because of COVID. So no wicket ends weren't dry, and the pitch, the surrounds were very lush. But the first pitch where they got it to reverse was hard because of the red soil. The second pitch wasn't. And so therefore they couldn't get any braces. Not, nothing was happening off the, on the ball. And so they couldn't get the ball reversing. And that was the real problem for them going through the rest of the series. Because they were dust bowls, they couldn't get any purchase on the, on the ball. Okay. Well, we accept that net pitches are always going to be different. Sometimes they're worse and you get a great pitch out in the middle. Uh, on this occasion, there's no such way as, as you can prepare a net pitch that badly. To get it to, <laughs> yeah. to a couple a couple of mates of mine were suggesting after we lost the second test match and obviously very soon why why couldn't the players why, why couldn't the England players they uh, opted to play a practice game on on the test pitch yeah. a I don't think that would have been allowed by the Indian authorities I think that one would have been that one would have been kiboshed straight away mm -hmm. and I don't think the players would have wanted to do that on on that particular pitch anyway the, I think the night the nightmares of having have, having to have the bat on that again would have been too, would have been too obvious. <laughs> but, um, but it was interesting. I, I, I personally, I think the our guys, England team, I think the selection, the selection of the teams, I think they were all too pre-planned. Pre and as Nadia just mentioned, we, you know, we, we weren't, we, we didn't change at on, on spec as, as to suit the conditions. I think we went in, like the big ball test was going to be the seamers, the, 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 and, and the guys, was, the, the players were even saying, they actually, they actually I've heard reports that when they were practicing in the, with the pink ball the days before, they actually abandoned practice because the pitches that they were playing on was too dangerous for the with the quick borders, not the spinners. It was the quick borders who were being dangerous on the practice pitches. So that that just shows you how the disparity between the practice pitches and the actual pitch that they were that they were playing on, and also the pink ball. I think this this pink ball stuff. I think that needs that needs a broader discussion. Mm -hmm. That pink ball behaves. So vastly differently to the to the normal red ball, and um, I saw I saw a graphic where they were showing the the speeds of of the pink ball, how it doesn't lose it doesn't lose lose pace off the pitch, and obviously I mean it it obviously uh, confused and had our guys in a bit of a pickle. So I think the pink ball, personally, I think it should be scrapped. I I, I really don't see any need for it in Test match cricket. I think in the ball, Gladdy, I, I did when you talked about the, the dangerous of the pitches and I did the interview with Ben Stokes just before the test match for Talk Sport and he was the one that said it got dangerous. It was the ball. And I remember two days before that, I spoke on the phone to Mark Wood and he said, Harmon, you've not seen anything like this ball. He said this ball was like, it was like what you get as a kid when you're sort of five, six, seven year old. You go down a beach, you get four stumps, a set of bills, a bat that breaks for the first time the ball's been hit. And one of these great big hard rock things. This is what it was like. It was like coated in pink varnish. 
two or three layers of varnish and the seam was a little bit more pronounced. And he said, and, and that for me, the pitch was poor, but the, for me, the pitch was poor, but the, the actual ball, the actual, not much was mentioned about the ball, probably because what the initiative is, is, is trying to be. So I think that's been stripped under the carpet a little bit. But when it comes to your rotations and your bearstone, I th- I've felt for the last 18 months, somebody in that system doesn't like Johnny Bairstow. Johnny Bairstow is a complex character who isn't easy to get on with sometimes. I would know that because I've played alongside Johnny when he was very, very young. I think there's an agenda in here, and I think there's Alex Hills coming over in the 2020. Possibly there's an even more of agenda if he comes in and takes Johnny's place. I think I think England have been trying to push Johnny Bairstow out because he's different, because he's not, he doesn't get in with everybody, which which I find ridiculous having played with somebody like Kevin Peterson. Um, but the rotation thing, I know you're a, you might be a fan of it, Nighty. I think it's shocking. I really do. I think it's embarrassing. Um, I am all for the mental health aspect of it, and I suffered big time. I hate being away from home. But when you're rotating players, and the noises I've heard come out of the England camp in this last 48 hours, Chris Silverwood saying they're going to rotate throughout the summer, people are going to miss test matches to play in the IPO, and we potentially could rotate during the Ashes. Game's gone mad. Game has gone absolutely mad. We're looking at a competition which is nine months away. You know, for the likes of Rory Burns, Dom Sibley, you know, Johnny Bairstow, you know, all these guys like that, they're playing that poorly, technically wise, after India. They might not be in the team in three weeks' time, four weeks' time. You can't, for me, you have to, you have to look after, especially in the Ashes year, you have to look after continuity of selection in your test match team. We've play, all played in successful sides. David, you know, you've, You've played a successful, you captain Ashford's side. Barry, we've all played in successful side. How do you get a successful side? You get a successful side by learning how to win. You get a successful side by being in, being in difficult conversation, uh, in areas, difficult um, situations, and you find a way to win. And that's not just you, that's your teammates and everybody that goes with it. And I can just go of experience now. I look at the 2005 Ashes. I look at the 2009 Ashes. The two teams, the two Ashes wins I was involved in. We didn't just rock up seven weeks before the, the last Test match when we lifted the urn and say, "Oh, well, come on, lads, we're going to take on Australia." You know, the first one, 05, was built from Nasser, from from the West Indies trip all the way through seven Test matches in the summer. Won, not we didn't even look like getting beaten that summer. We went to South Africa first side after apartheid to go to South Africa and win. We came back ready for Australia and we beat them. We did the same in 09. We got beaten, bowled out. You remember, we got bowled out in f- for 51 in Jamaica, ridiculed. And from that moment, Strauss and Flower said, how do we win Australia? People got moved on. I got dropped. Hoggard got dropped. All came back. And we built a team that got up to... If Joe Root gets his best team on the first test match, which is likely to happen now, in Brisbane for the first test match against Australia. I'm sorry for everybody that buys the tickets and goes over there. England have got no chance. And that's my but, rant of the night. And I'm sorry. And I but, do but Harmie, good Harmie, answer. Harmie, can I just can I just get your opinion on one thing? Yeah. I, I mean, we obviously have different opinions on, on the rotation. But the one thing I would say, and having been out there for that first test match in Chennai, I, I mean, you can argue, and people will, about Johnny Bairstow. I mean, he didn't have a great series in the end. But I would argue, and I think it's fair enough to argue that actually England went into that first test match in Chennai with what they felt because of what happened in previous games. That was their, for their first team. I mean, yeah. Rory Burns was coming back in. He'd done well enough to say with credit in the bank that he would open. I mean, the problem was Zach Crawley's injury, but he was available until he slipped over and hurt his wrist. But actually, I, I think that they would have had their first team available for that first test match. And they did, and they won. And they, they did. The second, but, but, uh, they got the second test match. Butler goes home. Oh, OK. But then you know what I mean? Butler goes home. We, we, leave, we leave Jimmy Anderson out. We leave Jimmy well, Anderson out, who's, just, who's bowled well. We've got... Until, until, until you've got 16 players and we're going to take this series on and play four test matches against India with these 16, 18 players and say, right, no matter what happens in the first test match, we are not pre-planned of what's going to happen in the second or the third or the fourth. And we're going to go that way. Look, now, I don't, I really don't think England would have beat India in this whole series if they had the best team and done them, made the right decisions because skill levels, India are better than England. 
but you've got to go through these ups and downs as a team, 12, 13, 14 players, to get you in a position when you know when things aren't going right. Joe Root, who can I re re look at? Right, I need him to come in. When the like, Vaughan was brilliant at it. Do you know why Vaughan was brilliant at it? He had two or three men that he could turn to. that He, he, could, he could go out and say, right, just get the crowd going. I bowl Freddie for two overs because I know we need a lift as a group. I bowl over two overs. It's all you're going to bowl. The crowd's going to lift and then we're going to get things going. There are things that you need as a team unit and team unity to get yourself in a position to be a winning strong side. In this, going back and forward, back and forward, leaving people out, giving them three weeks off when they don't need three weeks off. Look what they've done to Don Best. Poor, poor lad. It's, it's embarrassing. And that, for me, is my point. OK, right. Between the two of you, uh, Steve and Nick, uh, Ruth Brooksbank has asked a question which you've already pretty much answered, which is, does the current policy of rotation help or hinder England's chances of regaining the Ashes? Right, Steve, you've had a, a good, good old say at that. Nick, let's just consider this. Through this coming summer, which is almost with us now, a couple of months away, um, if things open up a little bit more, uh, and we're still obliged to be in bubbles for now, but if things open up a bit more, would you relent on rotation to do what Steve is suggesting, which is start to build a team towards that first test in Brisbane, G given that we've got India coming back anyway. So you've got to actually have your best team out as often as you can to try and win a series and uh, reap some sort of revenge. Uh, simple answer, David. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, you know, and that's where Steve and I perhaps are disagreeing slightly. But it's the flexibility, and I agree with him totally on Don Bess, and that, that again comes back to the flexibility. I mean, Moen was going home after that second Test match. He flew home with me, and he was always going to fly home. So why would you play Moen in the second Test match when you knew that Don Bess would be playing in the third? I mean, the yeah. management of that I found very strange. And again, yeah. it, it almost was as if that was going to happen. And there was just not enough element of flexibility on that. But you're absolutely, and the point of the question is absolutely right. If things open up a little bit more, definitely. I mean, you look at why is rotation been brought in? Well, because they've got 17 test matches in one year. They've got an iconic series against India. They've got a world T20 in India. They've got an Ashes at the end of it. And Ed Smith and the selectors are trying to get a squad of 15 to 20 players to be fit and firing and raring to go for all those major events. Now, if the situation changes and the bubble situation changes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right, okay. We've got some more questions that have come in live, as it were, while we've been speaking. Uh, in any order, sticking to the topic, because we've just been talking about uh, the opening Ashes test match, Jeff Price says, who do you think will be the top three batsmen uh, for that opening test match, and we think it's going to be in Brisbane. Uh, anyone like to go first? As it, st as it stands, I think I think the top three we've got at the minute, yeah. if we're going to go with what we said at the start of Burns, Crawley, uh, Burns, Sibley, and Crawley, yeah. I think that I think the the best place they're suited, all three of them, is in Australia against the bouncing ball. I think Sibley plays the ball well when it bounces into his hip. If if obviously if Australia bowl that way. But if the ball wider, he leaves it. So for me, he is comfortable on a on a bouncier surface. I think Zach Crawley, big tall man, again plays the bouncing ball very very well, better than the spinning ball. And I think Rory Burns is the same. So mm -hmm. I can see these three being our, our one, two, three throughout the summer. They don't play one day of cricket. They don't play twenty twenty yeah. cricket. Right. So they have literally got red balls to face between now and and the end of Sydney in twenty twenty two. Yeah, Nick, what do you reckon? Easy, Sibley Burns Crawley. I'm, I'm exactly the same. I mean, they've invested enough time in them now. They've got enough rewards to stick with them, and I would stick with them for, for the summer, absolutely. All right. Gladstone, Gladys? Um, yes, absolutely. That. I was impressed with Dan Lawrence. I was yeah. quite impressed with his. He looked composed and, and ready to play a test match cricket, so he might come into that, that equation, the top three. Um, but I, am, I, have got, I have got my worries about... About mentioned earlier about the, the, the techniques of these yeah. okay. players at the top of the order. Right. Question from Jason Hiscox. One of his two is: Will Anderson and Broad play together again overseas, or is it time to give younger pace bowlers a chance to gain experience? Well, if you want to win the Ashes, you try and take whoever the best is at the time. So, will they last? Will they last that long? I mean, Jimmy Anderson looks like he's going to last about fifty. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think they will. And, and there again, I would have played them in that second test match. I said yeah. that earlier. 
So I, 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 I'll be very surprised if they don't play again. And if they first play in that first test match at, at the Gabba and they bowl really well, why not play them in the second test match? I mean, that, that, that's always a conundrum. For me, there's no uh, substitute for someone who is just very good at what they do. And both Jimmy and Stuart fit into that bracket beautifully. Um, so as long as they are, I mean, fitness obviously is the key at this stage, that sort of stage of a career. As long as they are fit, then they play for me. Steve, do you agree with that? I agree. I think I think they're both. They're still. We've got a pool of players. You talk mm -hmm. about the one, two, three, but from from three down over, we've probably got two players for every role down yep. over that can comfortably play. And mm -hmm. I think Broughton Anderson. The, the interesting one is the, when you look at it, the Gabba, Jimmy averages Jimmy averages seventy five at the Gabba. Stuart averages thirty five. Yeah. And it's the opposite way around in, in Adelaide. And Adelaide's going to be possibly the pink ball test. So yeah. I, yeah. I think this future's, the future still is to toe them together because yeah. there's nobody standing out to take over their mantle. Mind you, the two of them didn't get it right last time at Adelaide either, to be honest. No. Uh, they did second innings. They didn't first innings. Uh, so let's no. hope they remember that one. All right, next question. The caveat, the caveat for Australia, you do need extra pace. And on the Aussie pitches, better pitches, we will need an archer bowling fast, not bowling medium pace. We will we will need Mark Wood um, firing and, and Ben Stokes bowling and bowling the way he can bowl quickly as well. So we will need extra pace to go ahead to go along with, with Jimmy and Brody. Okay, Amitya Sengupta. Uh, Ahmed, I'll call him short. A couple of questions from him. You've already answered one briefly, which is, do you think England management mismanaged on best? Steve says, you've already said yes. Um, what about, here's the better question, slightly lighter question is, um, what were your reactions regarding Rishabh Pant's reverse sweeping Jimmy Anderson? <laughs> I'd love to know Jimmy's, I'd love to know Jimmy's reaction. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, I wish I could do that. Cool, blimey. Unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable. What, no, you did that to show him up to? Yeah, well, with my eyes closed, I was running the other way, Glad. <laughs> just a word, just a word then about Pant, because he's a man, when India went to Australia, the Indian media were not necessarily that happy that he was the chosen wicketkeeper. Obviously, he did a great job in Australia. He has extraordinary talent and... Yeah, unbelievable courage to play those shots. I mean, even when he played the reverse sweep, or even when he was going to his hundred, he was still going hell for leather, wasn't he? For me, for me, that ends the the argument of best gloveman over yeah. the best batsman. That's it. That's the end of the argument. The way he batted in that, the way he batted in that that last Test match, the hundred the, to get to sixty and then go, was for me ends that argument because when you look at him behind the stumps, he's like. Like a, like a cat on a hot tin roof. He's like a speed hunt most of the time. It's, it's it's just crazy. But he gives him so much energy. But the way he batted in that last test match tells you that mm. you need the batsman rather than the good gloveman. Yeah. Right, well, on that topic, oh, sorry, go, go ahead, go ahead. He's, he's absolute box office. And, and cricket needs that sort of player to produce how, how, he, how he does it. And I thought his keeping, I thought his keeping is actually, actually in the proof. As I as I thought as I thought Butler's uh, Josh Butler's keeping improved in the Test matches in Sri Lanka and and also the, the Test in India and Josh Butler here just as Harry just said that's the sort of innings that the, you saw that blueprint of how Pant played Butler is capable of doing that and and he he the ha I think he plays with us he, he has his handbrakes on when he when he bats for us I think yeah. in Test match cricket. The, the, whoever he, he needs to be released to play the way he's capable of playing Butler and he can produce those sort of innings. Yes, uh, not easy. You're not going to do it every time, that is for sure. Um, Stephen Parry on this same topic, who is the best choice for wicketkeeper in test matches? So we've started the topic, we've started the answer. I mean, we, I think we acknowledge that Ben Folks is the best keeper, the most natural, the most beautiful keeper. But yes, I mean, the role has always, well, for 30 years, the role has been defined differently I think actually just to, before I answer that I go back mm. to the Pant Saha situation I mean they had that mm. situation in in Australia Saha I think played in the first test match yeah. and Pant didn't and I think the view generally it might have changed a little bit in the recent series against England but the view is that Saha is better than Pant up to the stumps and yeah. that's why I think Rishabh Pant hasn't played that many test matches only a handful I think three or four or five of his 20 or 19 20 at home 
<laughs> because he generally plays away from home where he can stand back. And that's what happened in the remaining series uh, in Australia. Um, I have a slightly different view of Pant. I think he should just be a batsman. And I think India should invest a lot of time in him as a batsman and put pressure on the likes of Rahani, etc. I think that may possibly happen down the line. Um, folks, yeah, he's going to do a brilliant job. I think with the fact that generally you're going to be standing back in the Ashes series, I would stick with Butler for now. But if you lose out and folks comes in, I have no problem with that. I saw him firsthand in that second test match. It was quite unbelievable how good he was and how quick he was standing up to the stumps against the spinners. Uh, I mean, it was eye-catching just how good and quick he was. So, I mean, I have no question that he's one of the best, if not the best in the world with the gloves on. But Butler has had a great six, eight months. I agree. I think Butler, as much as I would like last year, 18 months ago, I would have said Johnny. But I think Johnny's in such a place now where I think he's he's gone from that role. The, 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 folks, is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And what people get misunderstood is on how good a keeper he is. People don't. People are like tend to forget about his batting. He actually averages more than even though his short career, he actually averages more than than Josh Butler. So from that point of view, is it devaluing the Test team by playing folks over Butler? But I think both Butler can play innings as that seven that that Ben Folks couldn't even dream of. A little bit like Rishi Pant, and I think that's why he will always just edge it for me. I mean, the common thing, if you look back over all our sort of, as it were, lifetimes and experiences of people who were batsmen first and keepers second. I mean, they're all talented sportsmen. They've all got good hands. Um, but you look at the way Johnny Bairstow improved. Look at the way Joss Butler has improved. You go back, I mean, the folks thing is the exception because he started as a good keeper, as a great keeper. You look at, say, how Alex Stewart went from being batsman keeper. By the time he'd finished, he was a brilliant keeper. Dropped nothing. Um, you know, lots of people. Ian Healy is one of the great Australian keepers who came up through that same system, was rubbish with the gloves when he first started. By the time he finished, he was the only man in, in the world who picked Shane Warne every ball. You know, you learn with the experience. So I mean, it is possible to improve to a standard, I think, which means you can stay in the side with those other attributes to the force. So I mean, I, I'm afraid I have to agree with the Butler thing that he is potentially a match winner uh, with those all-round talents. Um, another question here from the floor, as it were. Dave Guy, why on earth are England playing 17 tests in a World Cup year anyway? It is a T20 World Cup, not a, a full World Cup. But 17 test matches, this whole schedule, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary year for, with so much cricket. Yeah, yeah agreed. I mean, the, oh, yeah. yeah, no, agreed. I mean, some of them are making up a little bit of time, aren't they, in terms of, um, you know, rearranged games, et cetera, yeah. that were missed out last year. So that's added a little bit more pressure on the schedule. Um, but the, in total agreement, I, I mean, you know, I was going to mention that when we we're talking about rotation and 17 test matches. I mean, crikey, 17 test matches in a year. Whoa. And okay. that two against New Zealand have come in right last minute, which have yeah. put a whole new spanner in the works because of the rotation and the, you know, the, the elephant in the room is the IPL. And the, them two test matches have, uh, have really sort of yeah. asked questions, big questions of the ECB management. Kevin Peterson was doing that today, and also of the selectors and, and where they go with that them, them test matches. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, Kevin's far better off saving rhinos. He's, he's doing a fantastic thing there. Let's just leave him to save the rhinos. I'll the, elephant, that. the elephant, on the other hand, even the, even the Indian elephant is a big beast. Um, <laughs> what about this thing? I mean, yes, you're right. The New Zealand test matches are coming late in the schedule. I mean, Josh Butler's been talking about it in the last couple of days. I mean, it looks as though the England management sort of painted into a corner already uh, because they are going to feel unable to stop the guys fulfilling their IPL obligations. And yet the players will say that there is so much to be gained from IPL. And the cynics would say, yes, loads of money. Um, but also in terms of playing experience, uh, big crowds, atmosphere, there's a lot of good stuff about IPL, which, for instance, did Joss Butler a power of good when he came back from there a couple of years ago in great form, straight in the test team and got some runs at Old Trafford. But what do we reckon? IPL versus test matches? I mean, the diehards, the traditionalists would say, why on earth would you sacrifice a test match for you know, a 20 over game? Yeah, for which I am, I am also one. I mean, I, you know, when you look at the rotation policy, part of that was incorporated in the IPL. A number of players, the white ball players, were going to be 
you know, Joss Butler would be a good example of that, missing those test matches so that he can play in the white ball games and then go straight to the IPL. Um, so it was it was part of the rotation policy. I, I feel very uncomfortable, David, with the fact that England, some England players may potentially, if they get to the latter stages of the IPL, will miss a test match for England. I, I mean, I'm all for the IPL. I think it's a great tournament. I think the players can gain a lot from it. I think the experience is a, is a very good one for them. But are they going to miss that much if they miss a couple of games right at the end? No, I, I don't think they will. I mean, the problem is, of course, that if they are involved at the end, it means they've got through to the playoffs and there is you know, the chance to win IPL. So that, you know, it's it becomes you know it's in a sense the most important part of it. But that, that's and you've it. got and you've got as well as that, David. You've got quarantine as well to yep. potentially yep. to come with it. And with IT, I don't think anybody should ever miss international test matches. Um, ECB have just got to hope Mumbai Indians get to the final as they always do. Because there's no mm-hmm. England players involved in that, and Trent Bolt's involved in it. Um, and I think there's another Kiwi in there as well. And they've got to hope that. Um, Rajasthan Royals don't get there because if Rajasthan Royals do get there, there's going to be one hell of a kerfuffle just before that that first test match because there'll be no Stokes, no Butler, no Archer. Livingston will be carrying drinks over there. I think there's somebody else in there as well. Mm. That that could cause the ECB a lot of problems or oh, big headaches from the outside. Lad, final word on that. Yeah, well, listen, the, the 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 white ball game. That's the danger for us traditionalists. You know. Sadly, the, the, the impetus is the, the horse is bolted on that, and it's it's hard to see how they're gonna how they're gonna. I mean, they're playing. There's a the T20 World Cup in India in October, and then there's another one in Australia next next year. Um, the, the, I think I heard them. They said they wanted to schedule. They wanted to, ICC wanted to schedule another another one day tournament in, in somewhere in the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, the white the white ball game is is seemed to be taken taken over from the the money man in cricket, not just well, the yeah. players, well, the administrators okay. as well. Right now, gentlemen, um, time is has basically run out on us, but thank you very much indeed for all that time you spent with us this evening. Obviously, one of the main things that we at Black Oval want to do is be in Australia next winter. So if we have a quiet word, anyone who knows Australians, can we have a quiet word? Please, will they let us in? <laughs> That's going to be the key thing. We want to come into their lovely country, drink their wine, eat their food, enjoy their oysters, love their prawns, go to the Barossa Valley, and maybe watch a bit of test cricket as well while we're there. And we want, of course, a full-strength England side to win the Ashes back. Um, in the meantime, um, as I say, many thanks to all of you who posed questions tonight. Many thanks to Nick. Uh, Nick, I'm glad to see your bookshelf is, uh, still needs some work done on it. And you've not lost the technique that, you've, that I've watched you use for years and years and years at Sky. Sliding lower and lower in your chair, through the, that bookshelf <laughs> has risen three feet in the course of the last hour. I'll, I'll sit up now, Dave. I'll <laughs> and and we'll, send you, we'll send you a new phone stand as thanks for um, joining us in joining us tonight. Pleasure. So, to you, Steve, um, thank you very much indeed to you as well. Um, no problem. Um, I just, it's great when you see all the books behind and glad he's got his books behind, now he's got his books behind. I'm still trying to colour my first one in, so when I've done it, I'll put it, I'll put it on the shelf behind me. <laughs> all right, well, get yourself a nice bright light, a couple of new crayons, <laughs> and go for it. Um, gentlemen, many, many thanks indeed to all of you who've been with us here tonight on behalf of Black Oval, Black Opal and the Lord's Taverners. Thanks indeed for being with us. We'll see you next time. <laughs>